you have a Bible this morning, I'd like you to open it with me to the New Testament book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 5 to 11. The title of my message this morning is quite simple, Is Your Faith Growing? Last Sunday, the question was asked, Is Your Faith Real? This Sunday, the question is asked, Is Your Faith Growing? 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 5 down to verse 11. Let's read, or I'll read, you follow with me. Peter says in verse 5, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge, verse 6, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love, And if these things be in you, verse 8, and abound, they will make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things, verse 9, he is blind and cannot see far off. He hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure." For if you do these things, you will never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Christian life is a life of faith. The Bible says it like this, the just shall live by what? By faith. The Christian life begins with faith. The Christian life continues in faith. And by faith one day, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, we will forever be with the Lord. Last Sunday, we saw in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 1, that we have a like precious faith, verse 1. We have a faith that's centered in the person and work of Jesus Christ, verses 1 and 2, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, in verse 3, we saw that we have a faith that relies on divine power, that he's given to us his dunamis, his dynamic power. And then we see fourthly in verse 4 that we have a faith that rests on the promises of God. Peter says that our faith is given to us with exceeding great and precious promises. And then fifthly and lastly, we have a faith that makes us partakers of the divine nature. And through that, verse 5, we have escaped, verse 4, we've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we all have faith as believers or we wouldn't be saved. But now we want to have a faith that is growing. So verses 1 to 4 is a real faith. Verses 5 to 11 is a growing faith. Peter wants us not only to have a genuine, authentic faith, he wants us to have a growing faith. And I believe that real faith should lead to growing faith, that a growing faith that demands diligence and effort on our part. Now, to summarize this entire text, Philippians chapter 2, Paul said these words. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that verse has caused a lot of people concern. What does he mean by that? I thought we're saved by grace through faith, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. And that's true. Well, what does he mean when he says, work out your own salvation? A little observation there. Notice it's not work for your salvation. It's work out your salvation. You can't work out what hasn't been worked in. Amen? Until you've received salvation, you cannot live out salvation. So what Paul is saying and what Peter is saying in this passage is that once you have been saved, live it out. That word work out your salvation was used for a mathematical equation that was brought to its conclusion. Now, when I was in school, math was my most dreaded subject. As a matter of fact, everything was my most dreaded subject. (laughs) I still have nightmares that I'm back in high school. Horrible, horrible nightmares. And uh, anyway, I had, a, I had a math teacher that used to love math, and he would do this equation on the board, and chalk would be flying, and his face would start to glow as he's working on this problem. And I thought, he's a sad, sick man. 
And he'd come to this conclusion, and I thought, I could never do that. But that's the idea that you start with the problem and you work it out to its completion. The same phrase is used now to work out your salvation. So what God has worked in, we have an obligation to be eager now to live out in our daily life, which is the idea of a growing, fruitful, and vital faith. I think a growing faith will demand, as I said, diligence and effort on our part. We need to work out what God has worked in. And then Paul went on to say, for it's God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So in our passage this morning, Peter tells us how we are to have a growing faith. And how are we to have a growing faith? Well, he gives us a recipe for faith. In verses 5 to 7, that's my first point. Now, this is a real note-taking sermon. And I say that because it really is. We're going to have seven things that we need to put into our faith if it's going to grow. I'm calling them recipes for a growing faith. That's my first point. A recipe for a growing faith, and there's going to be seven. But I want you to notice in verse 5, and besides this, besides what? Beside verses 1 to 4, a like precious faith, a faith in the person of Jesus Christ, a faith that makes us partakers of the divine nature, a faith that is based on the promises of God. Besides all this real, genuine, authentic faith, Notice in verse 5, giving all diligence. What does he mean by giving all diligence? It means to bring every effort to a task. It implies haste and earnestness and a determination. Now, just hearing those words makes me a little tired, to be honest with you. Determination, earnestness, haste. It's like the guy that said, every time I hear the word exercise, I sit down until the thought goes away. I mean, I just want to sit down and rest for a minute, you know? But the idea is that we have to put effort in. We're not saved by works. But a genuine salvation will produce as its fruit works. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. It produces works. But we have to put some elbow grease into it. We have to put some work and some investment We're all about investing for our retirement, and we put money away, and a lot of times it pays off in very little dividend. Sometimes we even lose money. But how about investing in your spiritual life? How about investing some energy and some effort? It will pay off not only in this world, but in all of eternity. So he says, besides this faith, this is the foundation, bring every effort to a task, bring along a speedy earnestness. And then he makes this statement, exhortation verse 5, add to your faith. So beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Now the word add there was used of an individual who underwrote the expenses of the choruses in the Greek plays. So the word came to mean a generous and costly cooperation, if you were going to pay for or sponsor a symphony orchestra, you would have to give some money and some effort into making it happen. In the Greek culture, they had these dramas and these plays, and they had music and actors. Well, someone had to pay for it. So a citizen who was wealthy would take their money, and they would underwrite or support the Greek theater. So the phrase became known as to put effort into. It's very costly to make a commitment. I wonder how many of you today are making a costly commitment to diligently add to your faith in order that it might grow. Are you just content, I've got fire insurance, I'm not going to go to hell when I die. I just kind of endure a sermon once a week on Sunday morning and then leave me alone. I want to live however I want. And you're not daily seeking the Lord and investing in your growth and walking with the Lord. I believe that our faith must be a growing faith. Now, this is how I would paraphrase verse 5. And that would be, now that you have a real faith, make every effort to lavishly add to your faith. But here's the question. What do I add to my faith? What is the supply 
or what do I need to add to my faith? So here's the recipe of seven ingredients. You want to write them down. They're taken from the text. The first one is virtue. So ingredient number one in a growing faith is add, verse 5, to your faith, virtue. Now the word virtue means moral excellence, and some translations render it that way. It means the courage to do what is right, the courage and commitment to live a holy life in an unholy and hostile world. Let me tell you something, Christian, whether you're young, middle-aged, or old, married or single, the time to be committed to purity is before the temptations come. If I'm speaking to young people today and you're not married and you're dating and you're being tempted sexually to get involved with other people, you make a commitment before you go on the date. You make a commitment before you go anywhere with another gal or girl. I'm going to be committed to God. And though everyone go this way, God's way is the opposite. I'm going to go the opposite way. So it's a moral courage to take a stand for what is right, even when everyone else is opposing you. It's the kind of moral courage that Daniel and the three Hebrews had when they were taken away captive to Babylon. And they were asked to eat this food that was considered by them against their Jewish law. So they asked the messenger of the king, they said, can we just eat some vegetables and abstain from these foods because we have to obey God. And they gave them that permission. And Daniel and his three friends flourished and prospered because they purposed in their heart, the Bible says like this, that they would not be defiled with the king's meat purpose in your heart that you won't be defiled with the philosophies of the world or the ideas of the world or the pattern of the world or the, the things of this world. But you have to do that before the temptation comes. When the temptation comes, it's too late to think, you know, what should I do here? I don't know. Let me think about it. No, you've already decided. You've already committed. So what you do is you add to your faith moral courage. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Even though my husband or my wife or my kids or my family or my parents or my friends, even though they all may oppose me, I'm going to take a stand for what is right and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. That's virtue or moral excellence. You need to add that to your faith. Here's the second ingredient, verse 5, and that is knowledge. And it says, add to virtue knowledge. Now you see it starts with faith. And then on top of faith, you add virtue. And on top of virtue, you add knowledge. Now, the word knowledge is the Greek word gnosis. And it's a practical knowledge where we, we, we learn by observation and experience. And we also learn by reading God's Word. Number one, it's a personal relationship with God. It's a personal relationship with God. So you experience God in your life. And that gives you that knowledge. I know God. Christians actually know God. Not know about God. You actually know God. Now, I know that freaks people out. Yeah, I know God. Yeah, I, I, I spent some time talking to God this morning. It's like, really? Yeah, he and I are just great friends. He actually calls me his friend. And we walk together and talk together and hang out together. And he rides shotgun with me in the car. And, you know, I mean, he just, I, I hang out with God. I know God. You have an experience with God. This brings you a wisdom to life. And then also it's known by a fear or a reverence for God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Far more important than having a knowledge of the world is having a knowledge of God experientially and having a reverential fear for God. And then last but not least, it's by understanding God's Word. God's will is made in God's Word. And you know how you get to know God better? In the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. We're going to have to get Gabe and the worship team to lead us in that song. That's not just for the kids, that's for us, right? 
in our marriage, in our occupation, in all our relationships, what we do with our time and our talent, our treasure. We learn about God in His Word. So this knowledge that we're adding to our virtue on top of our faith is a knowledge of God found in His Word. The wisdom and discernment we need for life is found in the Bible, God's Word. And I believe with all my heart you cannot grow apart from the Bible. If you're a Christian and you're not growing in the grace and the knowledge of God found in His Word, you're not growing. You don't grow by coming to church. You grow by feeding every day on God's Word. One of the reasons I preach the Word is because I believe it's the only way for God's people to grow. But it's more than just hearing a sermon and reading the Word on Sunday. It's a daily feeding on the Word of God. How do we grow? By feeding on God's Word. So we add to our virtue, we add knowledge. And then the third ingredient in a growing faith is temperance in my King James translation. Verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance. Now temperance is sometimes rendered rightfully self-control or self-restraint. But it doesn't convey by that idea, it does not convey that we look to our own strength. When it says self-control, it doesn't mean I'm controlling myself, but rather we're depending on God's Spirit to take control of our mind, of our emotions, of our bodies, and of our wills. It's to be demonstrated in every aspect of our lives. Charles Swindoll said it means saying no to the second helping or to the second glance. That's the gamut that it covers. When I'm driving by a donut store, just seeing the word donuts, I have to start saying, I rebuke you, devil. I bind you, Satan. I command you to leave me in the name of Jesus. I'm doing pretty good. The Lord's given me victory over donuts, but every once in a while I yield to the flesh and eat a donut. But, but it's saying no to donuts. It's saying no to the second look. A lustful look. Some guys say, I don't take a second look. I just take one long first look. <laughs> Is that okay? No. Jesus said if you commit adultery in your heart, you've already committed adultery. If you lustfully long for someone, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So self-control comes, Ephesians 5.18, by the filling of the Holy Spirit. You want to gain self-control, then yield your mind, your emotion, and your will, and your body to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Be not drunk with wine wherein is debauchery, but be being filled by the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit fill you or take control of you. Temperance, self-control. And then the third virtue that we need to add, or character in the ingredient of a growing faith, is patience. Verse 6. And to temperance, add patience. Now, temperance has to do with pleasures of life, while patience relates to the pressures and the problems of of life. Some render this perseverance or steadfast endurance. It's looking to God to keep going in hard times. How do you keep putting one foot in front of the other? You have patience. You have endurance. Our English translation of that Greek word patience isn't the best. It would be much better if it were translated Steadfast endurance. Steadfast endurance. So you have to add that to your faith. Now one of the problems is, is that we worry about tomorrow when tomorrow hasn't come yet. How many of you worry about tomorrow when tomorrow's not here? Let me give you a little tip. Tomorrow is not here yet, so wait till it gets here before you worry, okay? And then take it one day at a time and the Bible has promised you, as your day is, so shall your strength be. You got that? Today's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. So just enjoy the day. Don't be all bummed out about Monday. I forgot. I'm sorry I had to mention that. 
Back to work you go. Oh, no, I got to go back to work tomorrow. I'm just, I, I got to talk. My boss wants to see me. I don't know what he's going to say. And you're freaking out. And wait till you get there. Do you ever notice that sometimes we worry about something that's coming up, and when it comes up, it actually evaporates? It never even happens? And you go, I lost my whole week worrying, and it never happened. At least it could have still been a problem. <laughs> I invested all that worry, all that concern, all of that you know, stress, and here it just, it just evaporated. And we need to remember that. As your day is, so shall your strength be. God told the children of Israel, you gather just enough manna for the day. Jesus told us to pray. He said, give us today our daily bread. We want to pray, Lord, give me this year my month, our yearly supply. Lord, I just pray that you'll back up the truck and it will fill the, fill the barns. I want 10-year supply. Give me my 10-year supply of bread. And then in the end of 10 years, I'll come back and ask for some more. No, God wants you every day to depend upon Him to keep you going. Some of you want to give up on your marriage right now. As your day is, so shall your strength be. Some of you want to give up on your Christian life right now. As your day is, so shall your strength be. Some of you are being overwhelmed with temptation right now. The Lord will give you strength. If you'll trust Him and you'll look to Him and you'll depend upon Him, God will give you strength. It's called self-control or temperance. God will strengthen you. And then patience. And to temperance, patience. Perseverance. Steadfast endurance. Looking to God to keep going. Number five is in verse six. Godliness. Godliness. And to patience... Add godliness. That's the next ingredient. What is godliness? It is true piety. Well, what do we mean by true piety? We mean a devotion to God. Now, I love this. Listen carefully. A godly person is a person that lives their life in a practical awareness of God in every aspect of their life. It brings the sanctifying presence of God into every area of life. What do I mean by that? I mean when you're at work, you're thinking about God, you're talking to God, you're glorifying God. When you're at home cleaning around the house, you're talking to God, thinking about God, glorifying. When you're working in the yard, you're talking about God, you're thinking about God. When you're having lunch or dinner or breakfast with your friends, and what are you talking You're talking about God, you're focused on God. God is a part of every aspect of your life. That's what true piety or godliness, the phrase godly literally means God-like. So you're a person that is like God because you're a person that every area of your life, even what we call the insignificant or the mundane, is focusing on God. You know one of the most godly persons in the New Testament, apart from Jesus Christ, is Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph prefigures Christ in so many ways. He's one of the few characters in the Bible for which there's nothing bad said about and no record of him doing anything wrong unless it was telling his brothers and his dad and mom about his dreams. But let me tell you something about Joseph. When I studied his life, I made this observation. Every time Joseph speaks on the pages of Scripture, guess what there's a reference to? God. Every time Joseph opens his mouth, read the life of Joseph, and every time he talks in the Bible, there's a reference to God. God this and God that, and God this and God that. And that's why from the pit to the prison, Joseph focused on God, and God blessed his life. He was a godly individual. When Mrs. Potiphar tried to seduce him into sexual sin, what did Joseph say? He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against who? God. You know what gave Joseph the ability to say no to that sexual temptation? Godliness. Moral virtue or courage. He'd already purposed in his heart that he wouldn't sin against God. When his brothers were kneeling before him and he had the power to take revenge on them, Joseph said, I forgive you. 
And he said these words. He says, for you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. Do you bring God into everything of your life? Is God a part of everything you do and think and see? Is God brought into your life? That's what it means to be truly godly. Now there's a sixth element to growing faith, and that is brotherly kindness. Notice it in verse 7. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. So we add to our knowledge, we add to our faith virtue, we add to our virtue knowledge, we add to our knowledge temperance, we add to our temperance patience, we add to our patience godliness. And verse 7, to godliness, brotherly kindness. Now, this is the Greek word Philadelphia. And the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. It's treating others as your brothers and sister. Godliness does not exist in a vacuum. In Romans 12, verse 10, it says, Be kindly affectioned one to another in brotherly love. If you love God, you should love his family, and you should love your brothers and sisters in Christ and forgive them. Do you know the Christian life can't be lived in a void or a vacuum? You ever read all the one another's in the Bible? It says that we're to love one another, forgive one another, pray for one another, that we're to wash one another's feet, we're to bear one another's burdens. You know, if you're not a part of a church, there's no one another. There's just you. Have you ever thought that if you could live on an island all by yourself, there were no other people that you'd be happy? I have. No one to honk at you. One of my major pet peeves is honk. I want to remove horns from cars. It's like, why are you honking? I see you. I want to put it in park and get out and ask them if something's wrong with their horn. I don't do that because I'm afraid they'll go, Pastor Miller. But this week, I got honked at about three times. Maybe they saw me wanting to say hi. I don't know. But it's like you, you almost caused me a heart attack, whoever that was. It's like, why are you honking at me? And, 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 and it's learning to be patient and treat one another in the body of Christ as, as brothers. Be kind. Be affectioned one to another with brotherly love. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we should forgive each other. And we should love each other with a brotherly love. But last but not least, here's the seventh ingredient. Number seven is in verse seven. Love. It's the Greek word agape or agape. And to brotherly kindness or to Philadelphia, add agape. It would read like this. And to Philadelphia, add agape or add agape love. Agape is God's love shed abroad in our hearts for others. If the Bible says God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son, so we as Christians are to love the world. So Philadelphia is love for the brothers and sisters in the family of God. Agape is God's love for the unlovely. When did God love us? When we were enemies. When we were at war with him. When we were unlovely. So we are to love even our enemies. Our love is to extend beyond the bounds of Christian fellowship to even our enemies and those who persecute us. We're to demonstrate agape love. And the Bible says in Romans 13, 8, we get it this Wednesday night, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. You know, all you need to do is love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself, and everything will be fine with you. If you love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, and then you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to steal. You're not going to lie. You're not going to murder. You're not going to covet because you're loving your neighbor as you love yourself. So love is the fulfilling of the law. Amen? 
And love, by the way, is the birthmark of a true Christian. So it starts with genuine faith, and it ends with love. And isn't that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13? The greatest of these is a love, is agape love. And Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, not only that you have love one for another, but that you love even the unlovely. Now, you say, well, John, that's, that's quite a list. Seven ingredients for growing faith. And I got a lot of work to do. I want you to take this recipe home with you today in your Bible. I want you to highlight or write down these words and then make some notes by them and ask yourself, what do I need to pray about? What do I need to get on working? What do I need to roll up my sleeves and bring a speedy earnestness to, a diligent effort to? What do I need to work on in my life? Is it moral courage? You've been falling prey to temptation? Right now you're yielding to sin and you know you should be courageous and strong and say no? Is it a knowledge? You're neglecting your Bible. You're not reading your Word. You're not studying the Word of God. You're not growing because you're not hiding God's Word in your heart. What did the psalmist say? Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against Him. Where can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to God's Word. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Maybe it's patient endurance. Maybe you're thrown in the towel. Maybe you've given up. Maybe you're just about to leave your marriage or leave your children. It's so common, even in Christian marriages. I've seen husbands and wives walk away from their marriage. I don't want to try anymore. I give up. And they turn their back and they don't persevere. They don't endure. They don't trust God and look to God. How about loving your brother and here in this fellowship? Do you really love others? Do you serve others? Do you forgive others? Do you bear others' burdens? What about others that outside the church that are your enemies? Do you love those who persecute you and pray for those which despitefully use you? So I'm so glad in verse 3, Peter reminds us that we have God's power. And in verse 4, he told us we have God's promises. So we have God's power, verse 3, and we have God's promises, verse 4, to be able to activate these seven virtues in our life. Now let me give you my second main point from this text. It's in verses 8 and 9, and that is we see the recipe for a growing faith. But secondly, I want to point out the reasons for a growing faith. There are three of them in this text. Look at verses 8 and 9. He says, for if these things be in you, and if they abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of God or of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you lack these things, verse 9, you cannot see far off, and you've forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. So here's three reasons why we should grow our faith. First of all, we won't be barren or unfruitful Verse 8, we will not be barren or unfruitful. Now, Peter is using what's, a, what's called a, a figure of speech in which you say the negative in order to communicate the positive. When he says there in verse, ne verse 8 that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, you know what he's wanting to say? He's saying, if you have a growing faith, you will not be barren, you will not be unfruitful. In other words, you will bear fruit. Your life will flourish. This is the ingredient for a fruitful and victorious Christian life. He's telling us that if we do this, our life will bear fruit. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man or the woman that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Moral courage doesn't stand in the way of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He adds to that courage knowledge. And when he does that, he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and everything he does shall prosper and his leaf will never wither. You want to be a fruitful Christian? You want to bear fruit for the glory of God? Then you need to add these virtues to 
your faith. James tells us faith without works is dead. We're not saved by works, but we're saved unto good works. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. But let me give you the second reason why you should have a growing faith. It's in verse 9, first part of verse 9. And that is you won't be blind or short-sighted. Notice in verse 9, for he that lacks these things, what things? The things we read about in verses 5 to 7. He that lacks these things, first of all, is blind, and secondly, cannot see far off. Stop right there. Do you know that he's talking about blind believers and short-sighted saints? This blew my mind when I discovered that. Peter's talking to Christians. And you know what he says about some Christians? He said they're blind. And they're short-sighted. I guess if you're blind, you're pretty short-sighted, right? But the idea is that you don't see spiritual things. You don't see the Lord's coming. You don't see the eternal. You're short-sighted. All you see is the mundane and the temporal and the material. There are too many blind believers. You go, well, how can a believer be blind? Easy. They forget God. They forget His Word. They forget that they're sinful and proud and selfish and egotistical. They don't see their own sin. They're blind to their own faults and their own shortcomings and their own weaknesses. They become critical and fault-finding. They're judging others with a critical, censorious, fault-finding attitude. They're blind. And there are a lot of Christians that are like blind people. They don't see their own faults and their own sins. And they're short-sighted saints. They don't believe the Lord's coming. And one day we're going to go to heaven that we need to live for the eternal. They're blind to their sin and they can't see heaven. Now some feel that this is an allusion to chapter 2 of 1 2 Peter when he talks about the false teachers. You know what the false teachers were saying? They're saying the Lord delays His coming so He's not coming back. The false teachers were saying... We don't need to look for the Lord's return. We don't need to live in light of the Lord's return. Jesus is not coming again. That's a popular movement in the church today. Enough of this rapture stuff. Enough of this coming again of Jesus Christ stuff. The world's just going to go on and on and on and on as it always has been. So get to living life. Not so. The Bible says we're looking for that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something that you need to have for a growing, growing, vibrant, fruitful faith. And that's an eye focused on the coming again of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's an eye set on the eternal. If you want to bring God into your life and everything, then you need to think in eternal sense. What am I doing with my time, my treasures, my talents? Am I investing them in the things of eternity? So number one, we'll be fruitful and growing. Number two, we won't be blind or short-sighted. And number three, we won't forget God's forgiveness. And I love this at the end of verse 9. He says, not only are they blind believers and short-sighted saints, but they've forgotten something, verse 9. They've forgotten that they were purged from their old sins. We used to sing an old hymn. I'm always popping with the old hymns, but we used to sing an old hymn, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain. Free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Let me tell you what Peter's saying here. These people are so blind and they're so short-sighted that they forgot the sinful pit that God had saved them from. They've drifted away from the cross. They came to the cross to be forgiven, but they haven't stayed at the cross to learn to be forgiving. And they haven't lived in the shadow of the cross. I love the idea that the Christian life is to be constantly lived in the shadow of the cross. What does that mean? It means what Paul said when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I live, 
I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave His life for me. I, I never want to get away from the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to live in the shadow of the cross. I want to remember my sins placed Him there. I want to remember that His precious blood is what's cleansed me and forgiven me and that it was my sins that placed Him on the cross. So why would I willingly, deliberately go back to a sinful lifestyle when it was my sins that crucified Jesus on the cross? The next time you're contemplating a sinful thought or a sinful act, stop and remember that it was your sin, our sin. It was sin that placed Jesus Christ, the pure, holy, sinless Son of God, on the cross. And these people are so blind and so short-sighted that they forgot the pit that they were taken out of. I think it's good sometimes to remember the darkness that we used to live in before we found Christ. The loneliness and the emptiness and the frustration and the pain and the grief and the weight of guilt that we bear. And then remember when Jesus came to us and He forgave us. And He washed us in His precious blood and He took our burdens and He lifted us. He took me from a pit of miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock, the psalmist says, and He's put a new song in my heart. Amen? Even praise to my God. So stay near to the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't become blind and short-sighted. Don't forget that you've been purged from your old sinful life. But thirdly and lastly, I want you to notice in closing the results of of a growing faith. Recipe, the reasons, and the results for a growing faith. Verse nine or 10 and 11. Wherefore, here's the wrap-up. Here's the conclusion. The rather brethren, give diligence. Same phrase he used in verse 5. Giving all diligence. To make your calling and election sure. Why? For if you do these things, you're never going to fall. And then verse 11, so an, exchange, an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now there are three results of a growing faith, and they're awesome. The first is assurance, verse 10. The second is stability, verse 10. And the third, verse 11, a triumphant jubilation and an entrance into heaven. God wants you to have assurance. Notice he says, make your calling and election sure. What is he talking about? Make sure you're saved. Nothing more important than for you this morning to make sure you're saved. Make sure that you're a child of God. Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt right now that you are a child of God? Do you know your sins are forgiven? Do you know that you've been born again? Do you know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? That you belong to Jesus? If so, that's assurance. Blessed assurance. And songs are coming to me again. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, washed Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Blessed assurance. You see, when you have a growing faith, here's the context. When you have a growing faith, guess what it brings to you? Assurance. When your faith is growing, it brings to you an assurance. I am His child. And then it brings to you stability. Verse 10. For if you do these things, you will never fall. Now, that doesn't mean you're never going to sin. But it means that you'll never completely be wiped out. You'll never fully backslide. You might fall for a time. You might falter and stumble. Did you notice that the prodigal son, underline the word son, that he finally came to his senses and returned back to the father, right? He left the pigs behind and he came back to the Father. I believe God's children always come home. And when they do, God reaches out His arms and He receives them gladly. If you have a prodigal son or daughter, don't stop praying. Because God is searching and striving with them. They will come back. You just keep praying. You keep believing God. And God answers prayer. 
The one thing it does, you can clap for that if you want. I'm a, I, I'm, a, I'm a living example of that. I was a prodigal. And there was a time my mom and dad prayed and cried and agonized over their son. And what God has done is more than they could ever imagine. My mom is in heaven, but she lived to see me preach the Word. And she sat under my preaching for many years. I have her Bible full of notes, full of all her notes that are from my sermon. So she spent hours praying for her prodigal son that God saved and called to the ministry and then taught her the Word of God. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. But I believe that a growing faith brings assurance, brings stability, and then brings a triumphant entrance into heaven. Amazing. Verse 11 says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not a question of if you go to heaven. The question in this verse is how you go to heaven. You go, well, John, I don't understand what you mean. I believe that if you're a born-again child of God, you are going to heaven. Amen? You're going to heaven. But here's the question. Will you go triumphantly? Will you go victoriously? Will you go enthusiastically? It's a little radical, but I used it first service. No one complained too much. But have you ever noticed that a lot of times Christians who are going to heaven while they're on earth, they look like hell? What's with that? It's like they look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. Did you forget you're going to heaven? I don't know for sure because I'm a... I don't know. I don't read my Bible. I'm not that good of a Christian. And I just, I just have these horrible thoughts and I'm just such a bad person. And, you know, and they lack assurance. They're going to heaven, but they look miserable. I love what D.L. Moody said. He said, a little faith will take your soul to heaven. You know why? Because a little faith in a big God, that's all that matters. It's the object of your faith. But he said, a lot of faith will bring heaven to your soul. A little faith will take you to heaven, but a lot of faith will bring heaven to your soul. And that's the problem. A lot of Christians aren't growing their faith. They're not building their faith. They're not walking in faith. They're not resting on God's promises. They don't read. They don't pray. They don't live their Christian life. They're just stagnant. They're not putting all into it. They're not bringing alongside an earnestness, a diligence. You've got to pray. You've got to read. You've got to be in fellowship. You've got to say no to temptation. God saves you by His grace, but you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, even though it's God that works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. There's a joint participation there. I don't fully understand. But God's not going to save you apart from your will surrendering to Him. And God's not going to sanctify you apart from your working at it. So it's not a question of going to heaven, it's a question of how you're going to go to heaven. You know, the Bible says when we get to heaven, we're all going to stand before the Bema, B-E-M-A, the Bema, the reward seat of Christ. And all of our service and all of our works are going to be tried by fire. And there's two categories of works for every Christian. Some work, and their work is wood and hay and stubble. Now when wood, hay, and stubble is put to the fire at the Bema, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be gone. You still get to go to heaven, but you have no rewards. You have a saved soul, but a wasted life. But then the other category is gold, silver, and precious stone. Those are people that had a growing faith, and they served the Lord, and they weren't blind, and they could see eternal values, and they were living for Jesus Christ, and they loved others, and they forgave others, and they were God-like in the way they lived. And when they get to heaven, gold, silver, precious stone. 
And when they get to heaven, they're going to hear these words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I propose to you in closing this morning, those are the only words that matter. It doesn't matter how big your house is, how much money you make, how wonderful your family is. It doesn't really matter about your hobbies or your health or your bank account. All that matters is one day when you look at the face of Jesus Christ that you hear him say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You're going to go to heaven, but how are you going to get there? Is it going to be triumphant? Is it going to be be victorious? You know, the Bible indicates that some people are going to be ashamed when they see the Lord. They'll be saved, but by the skin of their teeth. I don't want to just go to heaven. I want to go to heaven triumphantly. How about you? I want to go to heaven victoriously. Amen? Let's pray.